Thank you for having, my gosh, we've got more than 100 participants, even though we tried to reject you all. So, so sorry. Um, so Peter, Peter Calthorpe is, is going to do a bit of a slideshow here and talk a little bit about his, his views of how things work. But I wanted to say before we get started, the reason we were so intrigued by Peter Calthorpe, aside from his long history, um, he was speaking to a very large uh, gathering of Silicon Valley power brokers earlier this year, and he uh, he came out against SB 50 and said that he felt that putting um, trying to uh, trying to disrupt thriving existing housing areas was not the way to go, and the upzoning of existing uh, existing solid residential areas was not the way to go, and he has a different approach. So that shocked a lot of people. That was really interesting. And so we've invited him today uh, to talk about his view of things. And uh, I guess I'd guess love to hear about why he doesn't like SB 50 and the, uh, well, there's a lot of upzoning bills in the legislature. So hopefully he'll get into that. So Peter, would you like to take it away? Yes, uh, I have no idea whether, you could, whether you're looking at me or, or the PowerPoint right now. What are you seeing? Both. I can see you and the PowerPoint. PowerPoint and, and the squares of a few more people, like as if we were on Hollywood squares. Okay, good. So maybe, and it, uh, is the PowerPoint big enough for you to recognize what's on it? It's huge. I'm seeing it perfectly. Okay, good. So let me just start by saying Hello? it is a little ironic that I am, uh, you know, some people think of me as the father of uh, transit oriented development. And uh, certainly for many years, I've been trying to shape uh, policy and urban design strategies that give us an alternative to more sprawl, more and more sprawl. I think with a group like this, I probably don't need to go into all the, the negative manifestations and results of, uh, of a continued sprawl future for California, for the United States, literally for the world. Um, there's a lot of background noise, so maybe if everybody could mute, it would be better. Please, yeah, well, Rick, could you please mute everyone? everyone? I, I, can't, I can't figure out how to do it with this slideshow. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, for many years, and I started in the 80s with a, a book called Sustainable Communities, I've been thinking about how to build communities that are less demanding of the environment and also better places for people to connect in and healthier and produce healthier lifestyles. It's clear that everybody driving, uh, you know, on order of 15,000 vehicle miles per household per year is not a sustainable future. It's not a future that will work in terms of climate change. And increasingly we see for the working poor or just working households, the cost of transportation and the cost of housing is breaking the back of the middle class in America today. So uh, there has to be a different pattern. Effectively, I think the American dream where everybody gets a couple cars and a house on a cul-de-sac just isn't gonna be the right fit for who we are. You know, we've evolved into a country where only 24% of households are families with kids. Um, so this old fashioned Aussie and Harriet paradigm is gone. Yes. Now we have, I thought- Peter, Peter, I'm gonna interrupt yeah. for just a second. Like Everyone who can hear my voice, please mute your, your, um, your microphone, the tiny little microphone icon, put a red slash through it, please mute that. We can hear people opening their drawers and talking to each other and eating. Uh, if you have your cell phone still on, turn it off and call in through your computer. I'm going to give the I'm going to give the password again because this is new that um, that that uh, was sprung on us by Zoom. The password when you call in normally through your laptop is nine one zero three zero four nine one zero three zero four. So please turn but off you your cell phones if you can uh, so that we can hear Peter and stop moving around and making noise. Thank you. But you've, you've reached your limit of 100 people so no one else can join the video, just to let you know. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Peter. 
Well, this is all just a big background. I, and I think it's an important background to the housing crisis we're confronting in California. Um, the truth is single family homes are a really important lifestyle. They're an important uh, way of shaping neighborhoods and communities. And the existing housing stock has lots of single family neighborhoods that I think I really think. Um, Early in the, uh, or in the late eighties, I did a master plan for Portland where we maintained an urban growth boundary, uh, partly by building a West side light rail line and trying to cluster new growth around its stations. And therein was the birth of the modern idea of transit-oriented development, that people could live in more compact, walkable communities and walk to transit and walk to local destinations, use bikes, have something other than cars to get around with. Um, in greenfield areas, which that largely was because the west side light rail was moving out from the urban center, it worked great and it's worked all over the world in various configurations that way. When we come back to California today, we really can't afford to build extensive um, miles and miles of, of new light rail. Um, we have to depend on something I would uh, call uh, bus rapid transit. Uh, and that, and also we can't afford to expand ever outward into greenfield development sites, and yet we have deep housing needs. Um, so what's the solution? Uh, I applaud anybody who you know, tries to co confront this problem with some serious analytics. Um, SB 50 was deeply flawed because by just drawing a circle around transit um, and being blind to what the existing land uses in that circle were, uh, it was a foolhardy attempt and maybe and very overly simplistic you could displace existing affordable housing under that uh, kind of law you could invade single family neighborhoods with buildings that were out of scale and inappropriate and the sad truth or i guess the, the really good the good message here is that it's not necessary we can find enough sites uh, to provide for infill housing in the best locations that we could conceive of without touching a single residentially zoned piece of land. Now, over the years, I developed a, a piece of software that allowed us to do this kind of analytics. And now I'll just get into the slideshow um, with that as a background. I think the challenge is how do we find uh, the next generation of housing growth that satisfies the economic needs of a uh, working population um, and also the needs of our businesses that need uh, a workforce close at hand um, without destroying the communities that we've already built and love. And I think there is an answer and I'll show it to you. Uh, let's see here. Um, while he's doing that, I'll make one more request for everybody who's able to call in on their laptop or computer. Please get off your phone. The phone is creating all kinds of problems, including uh, cutting people out who can't get in. So if you have the choice, get off your cell phone and onto your laptop. And the again, the password, if you're asked for a password, is 910-304. Thanks for your patience, Peter. And in, yeah. a, in addition, if you press star six, if you're on a landline or a dial phone where you can't mute it, star six mutes you. Say that again, oh. Isaiah. Star, star six will mute you if you can't manually mute yourself, if you don't have a mute button. Okay, star six, if you aren't able to uh, mute your phone, please do star six, appreciate it. Thanks, Isaiah. Go ahead, Peter. Sorry, so, um, you know, this slide just gives you some of the brackets of the extreme quality of our crisis. We have a huge housing deficit, which is why we have lack of affordable housing. It's why we have homeless. Uh, it's why people are doubling and tripling up in houses. It's why people are living in trucks. Um, we can't, we are not building as many housing units as we are building jobs. And that mismatch is creating a profound crisis that we need to find a solution to. It's dri driven housing affordability 
to a point where only 50% of the population's income actually supports their housing needs. Um, in the Bay Area alone, we built over 800,000 new jobs, but only 114,000 new units in the last decade. This, is, uh, this mismatch, of course, causes long commutes, which has huge environmental problems. And of course, it creates the housing affordability crisis and the homelessness. I started thinking about this in terms of, well, where are the underutilized land? Where is property that we could use to satisfy housing needs without damaging healthy communities? It turns out the strip commercial land, which was the backbone of the brave new world that the automobile ushered in after World War II, where we would cruise down broad avenues and pull into wide open parking lots and shop in one story buildings, um, was actually built into every master plan for every community after World War II. We had a one mile grid of strips, arterials, and they, were, they weren't places people wanted to live. And so they became these uh, shopping, linear shopping malls. Um, it turns out we started by looking at El Camino, which is a famous old street in the Bay Area, 43 miles, which runs from San Jose to San Francisco. It turns out that we could build a quarter million houses on that street alone without touching any residential land, single family or multifamily. And we could use the width of the street to accommodate new transit capacity. We all know what this landscape looks like. Um, and in the days of Amazon, these shops, uh, this type of uh, distribution of goods is waning. These are underutilized parcels of land, both in terms of density, but also in terms of use functionality. Um, we can turn these boulevards into places to live, not for everybody. The beauty of this strategy is some people will choose an urban life on a grand boulevard, others people will stay in existing stable neighborhoods. Um, the two don't over, uh, they are nearby, but they don't uh, negate the other. So we were able to map, as is shown here, um, the, the street itself, all the Caltrain stops, and all the commercial property. We can also map flood, flooding and fire danger. And of course, it turns out that this particular um, route is pretty safe. The Spaniards knew what they were doing as they moved up to coast of California. Um, but there it is, the strip again. And yes, there are adjacencies to single family neighborhoods, but if you um, if you conceive of just redeveloping these commercial lands, you don't touch any single family and you don't touch any existing apartment buildings. Um, I'll go a little deeper. Here's the existing, these are all the commercial properties uh, that sit on a segment of, of El Camino. So we have the kind of computer capacity now to identify every single parcel. It turns out, and along the bottom of this image, you'll see all the red bunch. Those are all the parcels of land that have frontage on El Camino. It turns out that if we built uh, multifamily housing on those, in those parcels, we could get a quarter million homes. And perhaps more importantly, they, those homes would use on average um, less water, less energy, uh, produce le less um, trips and automobile use, reduce greenhouse gas by 45% compared to an average household in the Bay Area, and uh, reduce transportation costs per year for those households by around $3,000. So not only are we solving the housing crisis, but we're solving a whole lot of our environmental crises at the same time by creating the opportunity for people to live in a way that has a lighter footprint on the environment. No, it's not going forward. Now, if you take this same idea and apply it to the whole Bay Area, which we did, um, we know there are issues about adjacency, but there's a lot of this kind of environment throughout the Bay Area. 
As a matter of fact, if El Camino was 43 linear miles, we have in the inner Bay area alone over 500 linear miles of this environment. And we think it could look like this. And I'll say once again, this is not for everybody, but when we look at the, 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 um, the market sectors that are in greatest need of housing, it's at the affordable end, uh, it's people that want to be closer to their jobs and services. And so this fills a huge need. Not Peter, can I ask you a few questions from the uh, uh, chat side where people are asking questions? Just let me finish this section and then we can go, then we can right ask questions. So we mapped out in the Bay Area, not just El Camino, but all the arterials and all the commercial strip land on that. And the potential is around 2 million units for the inner Bay Area alone. And if you look at this map, it falls kind of in a perfect location because San Jose and Silicon Valley get the vast majority of the, um, of the capacity, about 1.5 million households uh, would be able to be built within um, proximity of all the major new job growths. Um, this also sits on safe land. Uh, it's not expanding outward into open space, uh, green belts, uh, ag land, or fire hazard land. Um, it's in the right place on every level. And as I said, when you look at it from the whole standpoint of the whole, uh, all of this development has even better performance in terms of household costs and emissions and quantity of driving energy and water. Okay, so we can stop for questions there. Okay, I'm gonna ask a few questions straight from chat. Um, are you, he, I already answered one of them. Are you talking about vacant parcels only? And I said, no, he's talking about land where such things as Toys R Us and other commercial is now. Um, yeah. Susan Let Candell wants to know, are you thinking of taking all of that land or what average density per acre was used to arrive at that 250K number? Okay, couple answers to questions. The typical strip commercial is 0.3 FAR, which means if you took the land area of the site and multiplied it by 0.3, that's the size of the building. Uh, that's very normal if you have surface parking because surface parking takes three much about three times the amount of land as the building itself. So you're dealing with very low uh, density parcels, which by the way, generate very low tax base. And so one of the things that Prop 13 did to California is starve our school system to the point where we're now, I think we're ranked 47th in the country in terms of spending per capita on students. Probably the biggest tragedy of all um, for somebody like me who grew up in the Bay Area and experienced the best schools in the country. Um, so additional tax base comes along with this kind of redevelopment. And okay, yet one, a couple more questions along those lines before you get into the depth of it. Um, Julie would like to know, does this, are you talking about t turning it into mixed use rather than all, all residential? And um, David in Venice would like to know, do your numbers require that all of those businesses go away or is there some percentage you're working on? Okay, so they are all mixed use zoning. We have a hierarchy of different zonings. Not one size does not fit all in this vision. Um, the renderings kind of show one thing, but there's many different types of redevelopment. So we range all the way from small parcels on four lane roads at one end of the spectrum through eight different types of parcel up to large parcels, like uh, even some old shopping malls that are dying and being redeveloped uh, on six lane arterials. And through that spectrum, you have a spectrum of mix and density. So at the smallest, you may end up with just townhouse or live work housing at around 25 units per acre. At the high end, where you can build a whole little neighborhood, um, you could be at 150 units per acre at the high end. The larger parcel also allows not only for mixing land use, because we can put shops on the ground floor and then housing over. I think many people have seen that kinds of thing going on. Um, but you can also feather 
the development. So you may have a tall building next to the arterial and then a three-story building next to the neighborhood beyond. Um, and because this is a, we're going to develop codes or urban forms that attune to parcel size and street size, you can get this kind of differentiation. And let me say something, everybody's going to say, well, what about the grocery store? I can show you pictures of Safeway with housing over it all over this country at this point. Uh, 20, 10, 20 years ago, nobody even dreamed it was possible. And now, of course, it happens all the time. Whole Foods bills that way. But the vast majority of shopping now is going online, and especially now. And um, what's left is more social uh, commercial, I would call it. The cafes and restaurants and, and services and, and all the kinds of day-to-day -day things that you need. But they tend to be small businesses and they can fit very neatly on the ground floor of the uh, mixed-use buildings. Of course, that makes the sidewalks on the arterials a better place to walk, more interesting, more useful. So I think that answers some of those questions. A wide range of densities and a wide range of mixes, depending on the parcel size and street size. So the, I guess I'm getting the repeated question because it's a fascinating figure, the number. Would the number that you have there, that giant number, would that mean uh, that would that, that mean in a kind of a fantasy version where everything sitting on those parking lots now would be gone essentially? Yeah, Peter? yeah, yeah. So what we're what we're measuring there is the total capacity. Now, if you see the def the housing deficit for the whole state of California is two million. So the fact that we can get two million at a hundred percent build out just in the inner bay area just shows you that we have with this strategy capacity to burn. You know, we haven't even looked at Southern California, to tell you the truth. And we're hoping to get into that at some point. Um, so there's more capacity than necessary. And certainly there will be a more rigorous study that says, uh, based on existing property values, some properties will not redevelop. Remember, if there's an as of right piece of legislation that says um, you're allowed to do this, it doesn't mean you're forced to do it. So somebody who owns a piece of commercial property, they like the way it is, it stays the way it is. So uh, development happens in five year increments or 10 year increments and demand is different over those periods of time. So a very small percentage of this would be developed each year, but over time it would form the kind of reservoir to build up a different kind of community one that's more diverse and more transit oriented. Let me um, ask you some questions from the, there's about five or six questions about transit. Um, uh, pretty much everybody is very, very uh, critical of any ability of the Bay Area transit systems to be competent and to do anything smart with their money. And there's a lot of uh, cynicism and anger. I can't blame them. And so they're asking several different questions. How can they ever come up with a smart a bus system like you're talking about, given all the mistakes they've made, and why are you saying it's so expensive to do rail? Some people are talking about that. Why is Europe able to do rail, but we're not? But I think we've all seen the, the horrible mistakes with rail. But could you talk, uh, Peter, a little bit about how this um, super uh, expanded bus system would work? Well, interestingly enough, that's the slide, the part of the slideshow I'm just getting to. So. Uh, okay, go ahead. Perfect, I'll, I'll have the other perfect. questions for you a little bit later. Go ahead. It's a perfect segue. First of all, I want to dispel the idea that autonomous vehicles are going to solve our problems. They're just going to make our problems worse. They're going to generate more vehicle miles because people will use them. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll take it to work and they'll send it back home again to do other things, or they'll send it to the cheapest, most distant parking lot. So overall, no matter how you deploy um, automobile-based autonomy, it generates way more vehicle miles and therefore way more congestion. So it's not the solution. Around the world, something called BRT is the most affordable, effective type of transit. And one of the reasons we can't afford light rail is that we don't have the densities that many European cities have that justify that kind of capacity. Plus, we've gotten ourselves to a place where at over $100 million a mile, we can't afford enough of it. 
our cities are so spread out that to make transit effective, it has to be everywhere, and yet we can't afford to put it everywhere. And therefore, a lot of people just don't have decent accessibility to transit. Well, it turns out arterials are everywhere. They reach into every community, and they're pretty close to every neighborhood. And if they, if we could find an affordable way of putting transit into our, the strip, then perhaps uh, we get transit to be so ubiquitous that it becomes way more useful and way more accessible. Well, how to do that? The bus rapid transit is one way, and it works throughout the world now, especially for lower income communities, um, because it doesn't involve uh, below grade or above grade um, structures. Uh, it's fairly simple. You just take some land away from parking on a street in many cases, and you create dedicated lanes. The key to getting people to use transit is to have dedicated right of way. Otherwise, you're stuck in the same traffic. Uh, buses are a safety net for those too poor to own a car uh, because they're much slower than driving and everybody knows it and that's why nobody uses. But if they could move on their own right of ways, they're a complete winner. There's El Camino Real. That's a 120 foot right of way. Um, and of course it's extremely ugly. Uh, the reality is that 120 feet, 20 feet could be reconfigured into this environment. There would be room for six foot uh, separated bikeways, 15 foot sidewalks, still six lanes of traffic, and a dedicated transit way. Now, what I've painted on there is the word ART instead of BRT. Instead of buses, uh, I I call it autonomous rapid transit. I do think it's the next generation of transit, which is you can have self-driving buses that reduce the cost um, of operation to the point where uh, it, it begins to be much more feasible to have many more service hours and miles. Here is the technology. It already exists. It's in China. It's being mass produced there. It's being picked up in Australia very rapidly. Now these are high capacity vehicles and they're kind of designed for China and very urban areas. They are driverless and all they need is some painted lines on the street to follow. I think a better fit for America is autonomous vans. The idea here is rather than getting on a big bus that without a driver is more efficient and electric is better on the environment, um, but you get into small vans, which are organized so that they take you direct to destination. The same mobile app that you use for Google, you'd use in this system, and you'd be picked up by a particular van, which would hold six to 10 people and go direct to the destination. So not only are you traveling on a dedicated protected right of way, but you're also going, uh, having an express uh, trip all the time. Uh, the other thing that's important about this um, is that autonomy is really not ready to go in mixed flow traffic and complex environments. But autonomy, autonomous technology is, is here today for these kinds of environments that are protected and well defined. And yes, once again, it's already happening in the world. There's uh, uh, the first experimental vehicles in Singapore where they're going to define lanes and streets that these autonomous vans run on. We did an analysis comparing um, standard bus to, um, to BRT, to light rail, to ART, autonomous. And you can see on the left, the average speed goes up with autonomous because a lot of the trips are, are um, uh, direct to destination. You'll note here that BRT and, and light rail operate at about the same average speed. This has been well known for some time. So we spend a lot more money on light rail, but we don't get much better performance. The operations and maintenance costs, which is what determines whether you can operate a big system for a long period of time, comes way down 50% uh, of the cost uh, 
for the ART. And then the construction cost is also um, way down because it's at grade, it's really just creating a new lane configuration on an existing arterial. So that's kind of the, um, uh, what I had put in here. We have more numbers that drive down into things I consider really important. When you do something as big as this, when you create a vision of a different kind of housing and transportation solution, you have to look at the economics very carefully, uh, who it serves. And I will go back and touch briefly on this idea of the tax base. Um, Peter, no let me interrupt you before you switch to tax base with a few questions from the group. Uh, Lynette would like to know, uh, yeah, we've encouraged uh, mixed use, but developers find it doesn't pencil out. So how do you fix that? That's one question. And let me ask two more. Um, Sharon Cummins says, the only way this works is if the cities can control their own rezoning and require a certain percentage of the mixed use be reserved for small business. And um, somebody's asked several times, in your image of this future, what would be the density per acre along these um, arterials and the bigger boulevards? People are making a definite distinction between the really huge boulevards that have six or eight lanes versus the small arterials out in the neighborhoods. Yeah, we wouldn't touch anything under four lanes. So collector roads would not be part of the scheme. Um, the densities on the four lane roads, which are the minor arterials, would be anywhere from 25 to 50 units per acre. Everything would be mixed use. And once again, don't forget, this is a zoning that says to the property owners, you have this op option. Um, you're allowed to do up to this amount, but whatever works in your pro forma works. So for example, if you have a huge uh, store that wants to go on your property, you could build it that way. So there's no constraints in that regard. But the maximums would be there. So 25 to 50 on the um, minor arterials and 50 to 150 DUs per acre on the major arterials, uh, but being contingent on lot parcel size. So small parcels wouldn't get over 75 units per acre. How tall are we talking about then, Peter? Uh, I, I don't think any of this is affordable over four story uh, podium, which is what four story what? Four story, what's called four, four story podium development. So you basically have four stories of apartments on top of a concrete first floor, which is uh, parking and commercial. Okay, sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, what was the second part of that? Uh, oh, um, they wanted to know about a, uh, units per acre. You an answered that. Oh, Sharon Cummins mentions that the cities need to be able to control this because the state screws up every time they make a statewide law. So the cities should be able to have the say over what goes, how, how deep, dense and how tall things go. Well, the problem with that, you know, the idea of leaving it to the cities is that it, leaving it to the cities has led us to this um, lack of housing capacity. And it tends, because many cities don't want housing because of the economics, the fiscal zoning that I was talking about, um, they push housing away and therefore the housing gets pushed farther and farther into the hinterlands, into the distance of the uh, different communities, uh, you know, out to the green fields. So I think that there needs to be a mandate that each city uh, take and study their arterials and their commercial lands and achieve a housing production number that is at least equivalent to what um, a state mandate would say in terms of the appropriate densities. Um, I don't think we can solve our housing crisis by depending on places like Palo Alto to shoulder their fair share um, or uh, uh, to keep on saying, we'll build the jobs and we'll let somebody else take care of the housing and people can just drive. Uh, you know, I, I think what, what we're hearing, for, especially from Southern California uh, questioners, and we've seen this a lot in um, Los Angeles, is that um, the, we see very few housing developments rejected in Los Angeles. Um, what we do see, and I think it's legitimate to say, 
that the state's density bonus law is a disaster. It, it requires very little affordable housing. And then the state turns around and blames the city. So I think that you might have a fairly large group on this call who do not think it's the city's fault, at least not in outside. It might be in the Bay Area, some of the cities, but I don't think that's true statewide. Hmm. Well, I mean, the housing shortage seems to be pretty robust. And, uh, you know, I've I've done a lot of work on both sides. I've done master plans for cities as large as Denver. Um, I did a regional, uh, you know, a statewide plan uh, looking at different growth patterns. I, I did a plan for ABAG many, many years ago looking at growth patterns. And so uh, I do think that we need to open capacity. And I think the state should say, look, you're, e e each city has this capacity based on the amount of commercial land on their arterials, if they, and they should achieve that capacity. If they, if they want to configure it differently, I think that should be an option. Um, but I think that this is a rational way of saying we have to work together because mobility goes across city lines. We need to build transit networks that are um, that are region wide as well as local. Um, and those transit lines need to be reinforced by density and people and housing. Um, this is a way we can achieve that without touching any single family neighborhoods, without touching any existing residential home. Um, do, do we need the state uh, to mandate it? I think we can debate that. What I've seen, quite frankly, over the many, many years I've been practicing is that many cities resist housing and don't take their fair share. And now, that's not to say there aren't some that do take their fair share. I can point right on the peninsula. You have Redwood City and Mountain View. Few cities are saying, yes, well, we're happy to take infill housing, but many don't. And it's that uh, kind of hopscotch problem that uh, destroys not only the overall capability that we need to produce more housing for the sake of the working people of this country or in this state, and for the sake of beginning to shift away from the automobile as our primary mode, uh, we need everybody to participate. It, you know, it's a little bit like the virus. If a couple of people say, hey, it's not me, I'm fine. I'm gonna keep running my life the way I am. Um, the whole system falls apart. So I think there needs to be mandates. I think they should be shaped around commercial land on arterials. And I think cities should have the option of taking the end result and reshaping it if they, if they choose. That's interesting. I think it, you know, there's so much poison right now uh, between the public and Sacramento. Um, Scott Weiner has essentially uh, demonized communities, uh, single family homeowners, um, pretty much across the board. And there's a huge amount of distrust now because of that approach of just, you are bad people and this is what we're going to do. And of course he's failed three times now and, and he's created a toxic situation. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a long road to go to go down right now to say a new mandate for cities. That's why we're getting so many questions in the group chat about that. Um, well, let me, uh, let me just respond of to that. I completely agree with you. I, I told Scott that he was just going to, he had the wrong uh, strategy and it was going to build uh, an opposition force that would spill over into the well-intentioned ideas of infill as the only solution, major solution to our housing problem, and that he would poison the well. And lo and behold, that's what's happened. So politically speaking, how do you, how do you change that? I think by coming forward with a rational means of solving the problem that satisfies everybody. I mean, I know that there are probably neighborhood advocates in listening right now who say, I don't want multifamily housing in my, in my neighborhood, but that doesn't mean they can't have it in their community if it's placed properly and designed properly. And I think that 
everybody understands there's a, there's a crisis here of housing and transportation. And if there's a rational solution, perhaps people can come together around that. I think, I think uh, <laughs> that is the sentiment in LA. It, it, uh, Isaiah, could you please? Oh, no. Sorry, you guys are cutting off. I'm not sure if you can see me. Yeah, we can see you. Please okay. introduce yourself. Oh, hi. Uh, my name's Isaiah. I'm on the Livable Board also. I live in South LA. And um, I was just uh, going to say that uh, I think Peter's um, ideas around growth and where they could happen uh, match a lot with what's going on in Metro LA, like the Basin and in South LA. So I, I thank you for uh, speaking to us. I just wanted to uh, agree with a, a lot of what you said. <laughs> and I have, I mean, I have questions also about the equity perspective. Um, and I think you were going to talk more about tax. Um, have you guys spoken about tax yet? No, let me, let me, I have to get off the line in five minutes. So I do want to conclude with something that's very important to me because, you know, I understand politics, I understand design, but in the end, if something doesn't have a, a firm economic foundation, we're all just talking. Um, and I will tell you that we've done enough analysis on this idea that if you, t if you take and redevelop this land, the increased property values will generate massive new tax capacity. Now, granted, a big chunk of that will continue to go to schools. And that's a good thing. Schools need money. But communities are going to say, hey, if you want to put X number of new units in my community, I need more parks. I need money to make that transit system work. Otherwise, we're just going to have more congestion. I need money for public services. Well, it turns out if we bring back something called tax increment financing, which basically catches the dollars generated by the redevelopment and distributes it, not just for the, the state and the county and the city in this current pattern, but this windfall of tax can go to subsidize affordable housing. It can go obviously to schools, parks, and investments in transit. Now, how much can it accomplish? We're actually beginning to study that right now. The, the tax increment financing was taken off the books when Jerry was governor. Um, it used to be part of redevelopment, which got uh, disbanded. If we brought it back as a companion to this idea of grand boulevards, of, of building transit and mixed use along our arterials, if it was joined with TIF financing, which could generate hundreds, and I mean hundreds of billions of dollars of bonding capacity, we can pay for the new transit, we can pay for affordable housing, and we can pay for the needs of the individual communities as the population grows. So it's kind of a beautiful thing because it actually uh, provides its own economic engine. Um, and it, that's, uh, I know it's kind of complex in the weeds, but I know a lot of communities feel like they just don't want more housing because they don't feel they have the, the public services to support it. Um, it and that's, you know, that's the thing I'm going to have to end on is that um, not only I believe it's the right place, um, it needs to be thought of comprehensively as a housing, transportation, and financing package. Um, One last, that, last question from Isaiah. I see he's trying to jump in. Oh, uh, no, I, I was just gonna ask if, it, if all the incentives were, were place-based incentives. Like, have you thought of any ways in which, um, in which incentives for development or taxes, taxes that support development um, uh, would benefit people who are in the area who maybe don't have like, you know, a stake in, in the place because they don't own property, something like that, you know? Um, I, you know, actually I'm going to back up and, and just uh, uh, put one thing 
to rest, which is the economic analysis that we've done to date um, includes an inclusionary requirement. So when we zone for these parcels of land and development, X percent of those will be affordable. And the money generated by the tax increment can also be used in addition to provide additional affordable housing. But all these kinds of things need to be sorted out in great detail. For me, the affordable end of the spectrum is very important and um, uh, it can be addressed both by zoning and by the financing that goes, that gets packaged with this. As per individuals who are renting in a community, um, all I can say is this will make communities healthier, more robust, more diverse, and richer because they'll have a larger tax base to work from. Um, they'll have better transit, and I think they'll have more walkable environments. Uh, and all those things are going to be plus for everybody living in the community, whether they're wealthy or poor or uh, renters or owners. Peter, uh, this has been really fascinating. Many people are asking, how do they get a copy of your slideshow? Uh, you know, it's not public yet. So I'm not going to, I don't have, it's not done. I, I, you know, I keep needing to get all the pieces in place before it goes public. I will share with you uh, um, a three-page article I've written, which summarizes all of this. And Jill, I'll send it over to you. I think I did already. And you could distribute it to everybody. But it's a pretty good summary of what this, this proposition is. Is it a link to an, a, an article that has some of this imagery in it? It has imagery in it, yeah. Okay, we really appreciate it, Peter. There's a lot of skeptics on this call because we've seen the state try to blame the cities and we've seen the state density bonus law, SB 1818, uh, produce very, very little affordable housing. And then the cities are blamed for not approving enough RENA affordable housing. And frankly, uh, as a journalist and now as a, an advocate, I, I've seen these cities and they, there's no mechanism for them to add any additional affordable housing because there's no money. All I can say to all of that is that if there's no vision, no clear paradigm about how to solve a problem, people will spend their time blaming one another. Well, that sounds like a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's really true. You know, when people confront a really uh, a challenging dilemma that they can't figure out the right solution to, um, more often than not, people turn to blaming one another. It becomes a blame game. And I think the only way around the blame game is to come up with the right solution that works for everybody. Uh, this has been fascinating. Everyone can stay on. Peter has to go. We can